Uh, okay, let's try this. Okay, cool. I can see it now. You can see that now? Mm -hmm. Awesome. See, it was perfect. You guys, that was perfect. <laughs> like, oh my God, it doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Uh, we just uh, have been talking about wildfire, and now we're going to talk about droughts. As, as we talk about all these individual uh, disasters, we always want to keep in mind that there it can be interplay, there can be feedback me mechanisms, there can be exacerbations of one of these disasters on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. And so um, all good, but we need to also talk about these disasters that can occur uh, distinctly from other, other disasters. So a uh, drought is oftentimes tightly or can be tightly associated with increased wildfire risk, but we're gonna leave off the wildfire risk uh, for the time being as we have a little, a brief introduction to the, the concepts of drought and what we're talking about here. Okay, so um, when we talk about California and when we talk about, I, I think, well, well, let me ask, let me ask you guys. So when, when you hear drought, what comes to mind? Or what do you think of when, when you see and uh, hear somebody mention drought in California or somewhere else around the world? I just kind of think of how dry like our land is and how it results into like fires. Okay. Like when you're driving, like I live like two hours away from campus. Like when I drive to campus, after it rains, it's so green and pretty and then a few months later, it's just like brown. Brown. Mm -hmm. Kind of sad. <laughs> okay, cool. Other other thoughts or other impressions when you guys hear the term uh, drought or, or or related terms? Oh, um, yeah, mine's kind of the same as Holly. It's just thinking of like how dry looking it gets and okay and all that. Okay. Anybody else? I think of like that picture you just showed me. the 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 ground is cracked. This one, uh huh. Mm -hmm. It hasn't rained in a while, and when I think of drought, I mostly think of it as affecting humans, even though it affects everybody, right? Right. Um, drought is talked through like a human's point of view. Oh, there's not enough water for this area or that area, even though droughts affect everything in the ecosystem. Yeah, totally. Excellent. Perfect. So, so I'd say you guys summed up what I, what, how I generally think about it. I think how most people generally think about it, where I think we think about drought as in um, rainfall, right? Drought as in um, the, the normal inputs of water to our system um, aren't, aren't as high as they otherwise could be, right? And so then we see stress. And so maybe the, the plants are, are, are dying back or becoming brown. Maybe the ground is cracking like we see here or something of that nature. And absolutely, that's part of droughts. Um, here in California, we have a, a more complex um, relationship with water. One, because of all the stuff you guys mentioned in terms of, you know, it doesn't rain here year round. We're, we're not in the tropics, um, et cetera. Uh, but the other part of California, at least where we are, and for that matter, a lot of the US, we have a, a water infrastructure that also plays into this water scarcity. Whereas if we're talking about some other places, uh, for example, the, the areas I used to work in Eastern Turkey, um, you know, rain, no rain, and that's it. Here in California, it's rain, no rain, plus a bunch of other stuff. And so that's what I'm trying to illustrate right here. So in addition to the hydrology that we're talking about, the, the rivers that are that are in Ventura County, the, the streams in the mountains and that kind of uh, important stuff, which is part of our uh, water landscape or our hydroscape. Um, we also have things like what you and I are doing right right now. So we have our, our um, home use, our lifestyle use of water. Maybe we like to take showers a couple times a day. Maybe um, we like to do a lot of laundry because we have little kids in the house and they're they're pooping in their diapers all the time. We got to wash our clothes or whatever. So however it plays out, there's there's a large influence of our behavior on water availability and on how much water uh, there is to go around. Uh, we also have here in California a very sophisticated water supply infrastructure. We have 
essentially replumbed our state starting, uh, you know, about 75, well, more than that, uh, almost 100 years ago now, um, where we um, basically began shunting water all around uh, from, from north to south and here to there and everything. And that's created a very complex network. And that's also created a very distinct role for our state legislature and our elected leaders um, in terms of uh, policies, decisions that will influence how water is shunted around and ultimately um, what kind of water is available um, in different parts of the state. We have uh, very distinct regional approaches to dealing with water. So folks that are in the far, uh, let's call it northeast of California versus folks in the cent California Central Valley versus folks um, along the Santa Barbara coast, uh, you know, very different approaches to water, um, both to managing it and to um, uh, what we expect, what we, what we demand of the water system. How many gallons per day, for example, do, do we expect to receive? Are we talking about a resident or are we talking about uh, an agricultural um, uh, operation? Or are we talking about maybe a, a Silicon Valley, you know, silicon chip manufacturing plant type of type of thing. On top of this, we are a continually growing state. So there's more and more people here. And so that means more and more demand for the water um, that is here. And then of course we get to climate change. And so typically when we talk about, you know, disasters, natural disasters, I think um, it's gonna be the hydrology, the top thing here, my top bullet and climate change, my bottom most bullet that we typically would, um, I, I think would jump to the fore in a discussion in a, in a class like this. Um, but again, here in California, those are true, as are these other things. And depending on the year and the setting, these other things can be much more important, um, perhaps, on a given point in time than those other uh, more traditional environmental factors. That make sense? Okay. So now the challenge of that we have here in California is that, um, as you know, we are in more the Medi especially Ventura County, Southern California, the Southern California Bite. We are in, um, we have a Mediterranean type climate and our plants and critters are uh, adapted by and large to deal with these drier conditions, et cetera. We have things like chaparral, coastal sage scrub that surround our campus, et cetera. About two thirds of the, all the rainfall that's gonna fall, the precipitation that's gonna fall on California is gonna fall in Northern California. But about two thirds of the population, the consumers, the users of that water are in Southern California. So just from the get-go, we have a mismatch of where the supply of water is and where the um, greatest demands for that water uh, reside. Then we, on top of that, just natural, you know, in and out every year uh, mismatch. We also have variation and variation is a key story here in California. Variation from year to year in terms of rainfall, variation from season to season, meaning, you know, winter to summer type of thing and region to region. Again, the Santa Barbara coast versus Kern County versus the Western slope of the Sierra Nevadas versus the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevadas, right? Very, very different um, rainfall patterns, et cetera. And so I, I just said this, but here's, here's a um, sort of generic uh, map kind of overall long-term average. And you can see that, right? So the, as we get to uh, purpley and bluish cooler colors, that's gonna be areas of higher rainfall. Uh, per, this, is, this is annual rainfall. So in this case, inches per year. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that in Northern California. As you start to creep down south, burp, 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 you start to get to the lower, lower, lower rainfalls. You see the rain shadow effect of the coast range where um, in sort of inland of Central California, inland from Monterey, inland from uh, the Big Sur coast, et cetera, uh, which is very wet. As soon as we get over that, those inland um, uh, topographic relief areas, um, we lose uh, rainfall and we have comparatively less rainfall 
And you can see where we are in Ventura County, particularly in the Oxnard Plain, uh, where campus is, uh, Thousand Oaks, Camarillo, et cetera. Um, we are almost the driest part of the state on average. We're not quite, but we're, we're, we're definitely in the dry area. We're definitely in the coastal deserty kind of, uh, kind of rainfall pattern. So for us, we're talking on the order of a foot or so of rain in a given year is quote unquote normal. I want to talk about normal. I, I want to talk about normal in a second, but, but for now, that's the general pattern. Um, so to, to respond to this situation, um, starting many decades ago, um, folks that were uh, trying to drive the economy, folks that were trying to deal with growth and make California the, the land of milk and honey and all that great stuff, um, realized there was an issue here. And so we began the, the state, what would become the California State Water Project and all these other uh, sub-projects, which essentially involves taking water from one place, moving it to another. By and large, this is gravity fed. So by and large, we have uh, water coming from higher elevations and, and the, there's the pressure of that water going through pipes will bring it down to us. Uh, it doesn't always work. In some cases, we need to pump it. We need to spend energy to, to move it around. But um, by and large, we're taking it from relatively high elevations and taking it to relatively low elevations either in the Central Valley or the coastal plains. And as you can see here, there, there's a there's sort of a mix. There's a mix of local, there's a mix of statewide, and there's a mix of federally funded water projects. Uh, one of the key parts of our system is, go back, is you can sort of see here, there's, there's various lines. There's, there's some green lines over here and some blue lines over here. But where they um, most cluster, the, the most the most densest uh, ends of these lines are in this area right around here, and that is the the California that was the California that was the San Francisco San Joaquin Delta, and this area is where we suck out a lot of water and send it down to you and I. Um, this area is, is the convergence of two large rivers, two large uh, uh, perennially flowing water systems. Uh, MAF stands for million acre feet. What's an acre foot? An acre foot is one of the common um, metrics to describe large volumes of water, either in a river or in a water system. And so that is the amount of water. If we took an acre of water, or an, excuse me, an acre of land, and put one foot of water over the top of that acre, that is a, uh, that is a acre foot. And so 30 million acre feet is what we um, uh, have flowing through the Sacramento and San Joaquin Deltas. That, that maybe doesn't make much sense to you because maybe we don't have that much of a, a sense of what that means, but it's on the order of a, something less than half of the overall average runoff that's coming off of the Sierra Nevada. So that's a large chunk of water. That's a, a huge amount of water. Um, and so this water gets shunted and helps support two thirds of our overall consumption. So again, taking it from the Delta area that normally would just go straight out from the Delta uh, uh, into the Northern San Francisco Bay area, down into the main San Francisco Bay and then out uh, the Golden Gate Bridge or out underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and so we usur usurp that, we suck that up and we, we do other things with it. Um, we have uh, communities that have built up around these areas. We have lots of agriculture, obviously in the Central Valley that um, has grown up around this. And, um, and this is a huge uh, political football um, in terms of dealing with water supply, drought, et cetera. Even when we're not having a drought year, uh, it is a contentious issue. One of the things that has really uh, uh, set off uh, tensions in recent years are environmental concerns, are the ecological needs of the river, and in particular, um, species that are vulnerable, species that are becoming increasingly rare, things like the Delta smelt, um, which I thought I had a picture of. I guess I have a picture in a second. Um, but uh, basically, these critters that uh, need the water, right? They're aquatic, they're riparian organisms that have lived in these rivers for uh, 
thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, depending on what, what we're talking about here, um, and have done just fine. And then we come along and start piping out the water and surprise, surprise, when there's no water or uh, no fresh water, uh, there's some problems. Now, one of the issues is as we, one of the issues is, so here we have San Francisco up here, here we have uh, all the water systems coming in. As we suck water out and send it south, that allows the salt water to migrate further inland. And so that, that salt lens, which may be under heavy flow conditions, I don't know, maybe, maybe down around here, right? And this might be all fresh up through here. Now, as we suck out that fresh water, the salt, uh, uh, you know, it's not, not pure ocean water, but it's brackish. So it's partly saline, uh, starts pushing up farther and farther into the Delta pushing up into, for example, intakes where uh, uh, farmers or other people uh, suck water out. And as it becomes non-fresh, as it becomes brackish, the um, ability of those users to utilize that water resource degrades. And so there are some critical points when we need to make sure that the water stays fresh um, up to at least a certain uh, geographic location in the river um, to, to preserve these, um, this ecological functioning, preserve the uses, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the problems here is that increasingly in dry years or in drought, we don't have enough water to do everything we want to do. So when we have a drought situation or a dry year, we don't have enough to meet the three, gen the three broad domains that water managers in California typically talk about. So one is the environmental needs, that would be the fish and the ecosystem services and all that good stuff. Um, urban, which is basically residents and businesses, um, industry, and then agriculture, which would be our massive growing of almonds and, uh, and uh, fruit and uh, strawberries and lettuce and all the kind of stuff that we grow here in California. So something has to give in a dry year or in dry, dry-ish years. Um, so how do we do that? We've been dealing with it in these dry years by reducing demand in, these, in one or more of these domains. So um, we're not inventing more water instantly, but rather we're um, not sucking water out of the glass as fast as it were. And how we're doing that is, is reducing um, use in things like uh, watering our lawns. Um, we're reducing water transfers. So not as much water is going to farmers, for example. And how that has historically been met in recent decades is to suck water out of the ground, our groundwater. And it's leading to what we call groundwater overdrafting, meaning our groundwater is being recharged by the rain each year. And, uh, and then we can, we can pump that out if you have a well on your, at your house or, or uh, somewhere near your, your property, um, we can pump that water out. And if we just pump it out at the rate it's going in or less than the rate it's going in, we're all good, no problem. But if we start sucking it out uh, you know, faster than it's being replaced, then we get into some serious issues. And this was becoming a serious, this, this has been an issue for a long time, but in our most recent intense drought in the last few years, um, it, was, it was getting crazy. So whereas in some cases, in some areas of like uh, Fox Canyon and, and, and some areas in our agricultural zones, uh, we were having the water level drop hundreds of feet, hundreds and hundreds of feet, well, not hundreds and hundreds, but, but you know, over you know, 200 feet. And in fact, we were getting subsidence of the Central Valley in California. In other words, we're, we're, you can imagine if we had a, a, a soda and we had a straw stuck in that soda and you were sucking out eventually the, the top of, or the um, surface of the water goes down. Same thing was happening with our soil surface in various parts of California because we were doing so much overdrafting. So that's how we've been meeting our water balance. Huge problem. Uh, we passed some legislation to say we shouldn't do that anymore. We need to more robustly manage our groundwater. And uh, we're supposedly going down that route. <laughs> it's, it'll take some years to get into uh, uh, fully uh, kicked in, but um, uh, we, at least we recognize this is a problem. Uh, in terms of environmental water, which is a lot of stuff that, that we, some, we oftentimes think about, work on here in ESRM, um, 
the biggest component here would be leaving water, traditionally has been leaving water in river systems for salmon, for fish, for amphibians, things of that nature. Um, if we take, for example, the Santa Clara River here, so we have three uh, year round perennial rivers here in Ventura County that go from inland to the coast that dump into the ocean. We have starting up uh, in Ventura County, I'm sorry, sort of in the city of Ventura, we have um, the Ventura River, which comes out through Ojai, et cetera, and it, and it goes out uh, uh, underneath the 101 and dumps out to the ocean. Then we have the Santa Clara River, whose headwaters are up by Santa Clarita in, in, in Los Angeles County, comes down that huge giant valley, dumps out um, also somewhat near the city of Ventura. Um, and then we have uh, Cayugas Creek, which goes right by campus. So Cayugas Creek, uh, during um, uh, normal years, starts up in, uh, it actually makes a, a, almost a 360 curly cue, starts up in Thousand Oaks, starts up in the Santa Monica Mountains and curls down. When we have really, really heavy flows, it's also connected to the Arroyo Simi. So when we have lots of water, we have water flowing from Simi Valley as well that merges into the Cayugas Creek. And so um, if we take the, um, the Santa Clara River, the one that's coming from Santa Clarita down to the coastal plain, um, we have a diversion in there, a, a, a sort of mini dam that's going to shunt water during this time of year, the, the wettest time of the year, take that water out of the river and, re and inject it into wells, essentially, uh, in the Oxnard Plain to recharge the aquifer. And in effect, that's going to that's going to act to dewater the river. So a lot of the year from about that area down to the beach or down to uh, um, McGrath um, campground area, basically, um, we can have about 14 miles of the river with no standing water. So the water, whatever water is flowing is, is underneath the sand and is not really available to things like fish. And so this notion of in-stream flow is a huge issue when we talk about droughts, managing water, et cetera, in the state of California. We have various uh, laws that say we have to protect certain rivers um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and can't uh, dam everything or, or, or can't um, obstruct flows in certain ways. Um, and then I just mentioned things related to the Delta with regards to endangered species, rare species, um, et cetera. Um, and this is the Delta smelt. This is the, the infamous Delta smelt, little, little fish that um, um, has been the subject of huge amounts of legislation and fighting over and, and everything. And some people say, absolutely, we need to save this fish. Federally, we have to save it. It's the law. St our state law says we have to save it. But, but um, some farmers and other folks say, do we really need to save it? And so it's a source of huge contentions and, and lots of uh, fighting over um, this little guy that needs fresh water to, um, to live its life. Uh, another aspect, as we mentioned, population. So when I was born, there was 20, were 20 million people uh, living in the state of California. Uh, this last year, we doubled that. So there's now twice as many people living here um, as when I was uh, a baby. And that's gonna add another, we, the predictions are, you know, predictions are always hard, but, but the guesstimate is something on the order of another 20 million uh, in the next 30 years. So again, all these folks need water, all these folks need to wash their clothes, et cetera. And uh, in effect, add to the drought pressure on the state of California. Questions so far, is this making sense, you guys? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I'll, I'll just say that uh, climate change is changing all this. Climate, so our system was built, as we'll see with many of our disasters, our, our infrastructure, our response system, our food systems, our, as we've been seeing in Texas this week, or this last week or so, um, our electrical systems were designed under certain conditions and our changing world is making um, us uh, hopefully rigorously test those assumptions? And is that really going to um, be, are, are the conditions that we thought the system was designed for really the conditions that we're going to be experiencing in the near future or experiencing now? And increasingly, the answer is no. And we're seeing that here in terms of our water system, most 
explicitly in the reduction in snowpack in the Sierras, which is the stuff that melts and then goes into that water system that then distributes water around the state. Um, so the famous quote over here that everybody thinks is attributed to Mark Twain, but he didn't actually say it, but um, or didn't invent the, the statement, I should say, uh, is that whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over, right? So in the West, we have these very bizarre, compared to the rest of the country and a lot of the rest of the world, we have these very bizarre laws when it comes to water. Um, this, our, our laws are essentially um, uh, who has the oldest deed to the land. And it's not necessarily, hey, who's closest to the river or who has the greatest need? It's, it's who was here first, essentially. And so this water law in the Western US is hugely contentious. And so that set up the, this huge role for governance and the legal machinations um, are a huge uh, contributor to some of the stress and the strain in terms of these, this drought conditions. And how are we doing on time here? Where's my, check my time. Okay, cool. So um, now that's a little bit of background in terms of California. Uh, drought, when we talk about drought broadly, writ, what do we mean? Um, there's no one definition of drought. So that's one of the things that's a little bit challenging. Um, depends on the scale we're talking about, depends on the setting we're talking about. But here are four different that I, I don't think, now that I look at it, I think I've done a cruddy job of making this slide. I think I have to redo this slide, this is lame. Um, but uh, uh, four different broad types of drought that people will typically talk about. One is uh, meteorological or, or rainfall. And this is what you guys all, all touched on. So when we talk about that type of drought, we mean, we're used to a certain amount of rain, and either it's less than that amount, or it's not, or it hasn't happened at all. So that would be that would qualify as, as a type of drought. We can also talk about uh, the drought availability in the or, or the the drought, the low amount of water in the soil. So either if we're talking about a forest or something like that, we talk about soil moisture. If we're in an agricultural setting, it would be um, the the um, water available for our crops to take up. But same idea, um, uh, not, not enough that we want to, not a deviation from the normal or a deviation from the necessary. A third type would be um, surface water drought. So surface water drought, something like hydrological drought, which would be um, the low levels of water in a reservoir, low levels of water in a river, something of that nature. Um, and then uh, the fourth example here would be water supply drought. And again, this is what we oftentimes are talking about in California, um, which is a period when um, there's a, a scarce enough supply of water that it has that it induces us to do some change behavior. So we have to prioritize things differently. We have to um, uh, uh, make some judgment calls in terms of who gets what. Um, in some cases, it's judgment calls. In some cases, those judgment calls are forced on us by laws, um, but, but it, it does uh, uh, force a change in usage. So we have meteorological, agricultural, hydrological, and, and water supply. All of these are a, a valid way to talk about drought. Um, obviously, when we're in an intense drought, all of these things get triggered. Questions? Does that make sense? Sure, I'm assuming it makes sense. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, okay, so here, here's, here's a little um, diagram of what we're talking about here. And um, I, I think maybe we'll take a quick, we'll take a quick five minute break after we talk about this diagram, let everybody get a little stretch here. Um, so the, here, the, here are those four types of droughts that we talked about, right? So starting at top is meteorological, going to agricultural, hydrological, and then um, the, and, and this figure is labeled socioeconomic, but this is the, the water supply uh, drought. And um, there's various things that will go into these um, factors. If we start on the top of this figure and move down, we're talking about the thing that uh, can happen the most, uh, the quickest, right? Or, or the shortest time scale. So meteorological drought, it was raining this week and all of a sudden it stopped raining. 
right? Okay, so that can happen pretty fast. Whereas we have to usually go into a much more extensive period of that water stress before we get to um, the soil uh, or the agricultural water stress. And uh, again, a bit longer for us to see actually the reduction in surface water flows, say in a river. And then um, usually even longer for us to see significant, even though we might see some significance early on, for example, agricultural drought, if we're a farmer, we might have to change something or do something different. Um, but, but the real heavy impacts that we tend to see in our society um, are gonna come after a longer period of time. And, um, and, and these other uh, droughts, these other components of drought have already kicked in. Cool? Make sense? Yep. Okay. Why don't we take a quick uh, five minute break here and everybody can take a stretch and uh, we'll come back and keep talking about droughts. <laughs> 